in social media, for example, you know, we're going to create content that involves the people that we're talking to. How's it going, everyone? I'm here with Mike from Story Miners. Very excited about our conversation today because we're both fans of storytelling. And Mike, if I may, I'm going to start with, with something that you said that I'd love to hear more about. Um, sure. And I'll read it so that I, you know, from your emails so that I don't screw this up. You said that you see story not as much as a tale, rather as a design tool that lets people envision future opportunities. Tell so me more about that. That's a very intriguing statement. All right, well, let's do, thank you for starting with that. Let's dig into it. I think um, we're all wired for stories as humans. And that's a phrase I hear all the time. I don't know who said it first, but everybody's talking about how for tens of thousands of years, we've all learned and taught and passed on things through story. And, and that's, that's true. But in the United States, for example, when um, people say, don't tell me a story, it means don't tell me a lie, like a fib or something that you've made up. And everyone's got the connotation around the world word story of a bedtime story. All right, if you get ready for bed and brush your teeth, I'll tell you a story, you know, where Uncle Joe comes by. Um, also, they're the kind of stories that we hear in the press and from politicians. And sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not. And sometimes it's just all over the place. So most people associate the word story with something that they're trying to share or something that they've heard. But here's where I think it can be a little different. Because the world has changed so much, most of us are trying to figure out how to do the new things that matter. So we can't go back and just improve on the things that we've already done 5%. It doesn't matter because that's not what people need. I don't need your factory to run 5% faster. I need you to produce Band-Aids or alcohol instead of toy trains. It's, it's big changes that people are looking for. So we all know that change is hard and we know that stories have a way of engaging people immediately. I don't know what parts of the brain fire, but I think it's a lot of them. At least that's how I feel about it. And if you tell a story that's been designed well, you can imaginarily transport people into a world that you've created like James Cameron does when he does movies or like Disney does when they do movies or Marvel. All these worlds with their points of view and their characters and their stories are made up from scratch. And we just listen in and we believe everything. It's so entertaining, we're relaxed, it goes right into our head and we can remember everything, it's nice. So I think story is a design tool. And when you're trying to figure out the future for your business, it also works for your life or your family or your community. But if you give them enough details that let them know that they're actually part of their story and they know what role to play, that there's something there for them, all of a sudden resistance turns into support and they will help you get there. So that's basically uh, the idea behind it. So if I'm hearing you right, you're making them part of the story instead of you telling them the story that you want to tell them. Oh, here, I'm making this widget. Here's how I'm making the widget. You should buy it because I'm just making this widget. Exactly. And now we can end the interview because that is the main point. <laughs> well, hold on. I have more questions for you. How do you, so give us an example of how, how you create this for your, for your clients. How, are you asking how do about, mm -hmm. are you more interested in the actually how do you construct a story that's specific to a niche or do, are you looking for an example of one tell me which way you want me to go yeah give us an example of how you work to the client using applying this philosophy of yours okay so um about i guess that's about nine or ten years ago i did a free project for a religious institution here in the Atlanta area. They started a preschool and they wanted more people to send their kids to this religious preschool. So I went over, um, I was referred in by a, call, a mutual friend. I went in, I looked at the facilities, I met with the director, and then I saw something that just literally shocked me. This woman is very, very small. She's 
not even one and a half meters. She's like four foot eight, okay? Not, not very big. And when kids would come up to her, she would get down to their eye level and talk to them like an adult. She didn't use baby language. Every kid, whether they were in first grade or fifth grade or preschool, they would get her full attention. She was actively listening to what they were saying and they were at just the right eye level. She treated them with the respect that an adult would command. And that really surprised me. And then I asked her about that later and she told me, yeah, that's one of the philosophies of our school. That's one of the things that we do. So we ended up creating um, uh, a brochure to help them introduce this new school to people in the community. And we did it in the form of a kid's cartoon book. And we knew that the kids weren't gonna be reading it, the adults were, but by bringing them back in time to their own childhood and making this lady and her students and teachers the stars, what we did is we gave the parents a chance to see what the interactions between this director and the kids were, and a chance to step into the classroom and see how they're learning methods were being applied and then to see what the kids talked about when they went home. So we created this third eye that let the parents feel what the experience would be like for their child. So they could decide whether it was a really good match or not. And then when they came in for a visit, they met the star of the cartoon story and they looked pretty much alike. And their sales went like this. They fully booked out the next year. How cool. Um, that makes me think of how we're trying to create this immersive environment for our customers to, mm -hmm. to be able to feel within that space. But we forget that that can be done in printed form. What you actually did is took the story to them and allowed them to be immersed in what, what the feel of the school would be, of the preschool would be. Yeah. And in the digital space, we do something similar. We try to create environments that mm -hmm. and and take them to where they are. We're a little bit like the traveling salesman. We mm -hmm. go to where they are and and try to make them part of the story, immerse them in the story. So to me, and what I'm hearing from you too, to me, storytelling is community building. It's uh, is is it's very hard to create a compelling story where the people we're trying to sell to are not a protagonist in the story. Mm -hmm. So, so we create environments, we take them to them. So in, in the, in, in social media, for example, you know, we're going to create content that involves the people that we're talking to. TikTok right now is so popular because it has a community vibe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it's very appealing to, to, when you feel like that community was brought to you. Mm -hmm. um, and probably storytelling has, has a part in it because it does that thing to the brain, like you said, um, but also because it's unexpected because for so long, we've just been pitched at. We've been thrown ads at. We haven't been invited in, invited into the experience. Now, obviously good marketers and good storytellers like you know how to do it. But one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because it's not that common. It's not. You're, I, I can't tell you how many unsolicited invites of people who say, I've looked at your profile and we have a lot of things in common. I think we it would be beneficial to meet. Uh, and then you then you say yes, and they start spitting out, you know, sales letters one after the other, and it's all about them. It's not about what you build together. I was listening to um a brand new book that I love. It's called Story Intelligence, and it's by, um, you can see the name at the bottom, Richard Stone and Scott Livengood, and they've been practitioners of story for decades, and I'm learning so much from them. But the story I heard today was about, um, to, to prove your point about community, they did some work, um, I guess a dozen or 15 years ago, and it was all about how some countries were trying to bring in lots of immigrants. And some countries have said, all right, you can come in and, and we'll help you. But when the lights go out at night, you stay in your place and we'll stay in our place. You know, we're going to respect each other's differences, but we're not going to try to get together too much. And over time, those relationships kind of fall apart and they're replaced with tension. And then 
the people who live there first feel entitled and those who came second don't feel welcome. And it just creates this kind of a problem. So then um, Richard goes on, he's the author, the narrator of the book. He goes on to explain that in another area of the world, what they did is when immigrants wanted to come in, they'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't really have any housing. Hmm. But we do have some land and some building materials. Um, why don't we build your house together? Mm. And that gives the people who are building the houses a chance to meet each other, talk to each other. It allows the, the, um, the, the first settlers to preserve the dignity of their architecture. It allows the new settlers to share what they know, add some value to the project, and learn what some of the guidelines are because they're moving to a new place. And from that, jobs happen and people get married and there's all kinds of political coordination. But it's so nice when you build something with other people, that act of creating is a story in and of itself. And the more of that that you can capture when you're doing your marketing, your advertising, your persuading, your, your leading, your team building, the better. Because at the end of the day, that brings people a lot of joy and connection. It helps them to understand where they are in the world, what they can contribute and how they're making an impact that matters with others. And that's, that's the human condition. Yeah, you're touching upon the concept of inclusivity, which mm -hmm. to, to tell you the truth has only come to the forefront in marketing conversations recently. Um, we've been trying to do inclusivity by showing a different ethnic group in a picture. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's fake inclusivity. Yeah. Inclusivity means, you know, bringing all of those stories together and building something together and something that appeals to everyone. And at the core of it is the human condition, the, the desire to belong, the desire to feel safe, the desire to feel loved. Um, fundamentally, those are the things that, that I hear from your story of, that you got from the book of, of this other way of building a community. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the things that's also powerful about story, and you hinted at that when you asked me that first question, is about how so many people resist change. Some people don't even know why they resist change, but a lot of people fear leaving things behind like an untapped opportunity. You know, some people who have things in their basement that they don't need, I might need it one day. You know, it's that depression era mentality that grandparents you know, typically have. You might need that grill, you might need that old pair of underwear. I don't think so, but you should keep it just in case. So um, when you're sharing, uh, when you're building a story with somebody else, you know, be it a, a new community, uh, a different business that you're doing a, jo a joint venture with, when you're building something together, you're getting something new before you have to let go of something else. And that's kind of reversing the order of change. So it's a lot more comfortable for people to feel more proud of what they've built together. And then they'd almost rather be known for the connected project rather than for the legacy project. They can let that go more easily. And that just brings people together. That's what helps bond people to brands and people to their communities or to their religious institutions or political parties. It's all the same formula. So when you work with your clients, how do you, how do you explain to them the benefits that they're gonna receive from taking this approach? Because change is very hard. One of the things yeah. that leaders struggle with is change, especially, especially right now with all the digital options that we have. Um, and they're unclear, right? Another thing that you and I had talked offline is the, is this the lack of clarity in so many areas of marketing right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that your clients struggle with that. Um, you know, they how, do do, how do you work with them to help them gain that clarity? You know, that's the, that, that is an amazing question. I'm not saying that's a great question to buy time to think. A lot of people do that. They say, let me, what a great question. And they're thinking. But I really appreciate that question. Um, I think that clarity is a blind spot for most leaders. A lot of people don't realize the value of clarity and they underestimate how hard it is to achieve. You know, I can't remember if it was Hemingway or somebody else, but they said, if you'll or maybe, uh, what was the guy, Winston Churchill, if you want me to do a shorter speech, give me more time. 
You know, yeah. a TED Talk, 18 minutes, it takes some people months to do, but yeah. they could do a two hour pitch just like that. You know, finding that, that eliminating the word that don't matter, ordering things in the right way so that you've got a clear, compelling and actionable message is really hard work. And changing topics a little bit, I really believe that's the leader's new job. I don't think it's the leader's job to bark orders about what the new sales number should be or 10% more growth. I think they have to be the ones to paint a really clear picture of what the future is going to look like. They have to own the narrative, not only about what tomorrow looks like, but about how we're going to get there. And that means that leaders have to focus on some new and different things. So clarity is job one. And the last job is to be better storyteller. And we know what's happening right now with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you look at it from a, you know, a scientific perspective, one in a million is really low odds for a blood clot that might not kill you. you know? So scientifically speaking, when you're looking at people in a group, statistically insignificant. But what about that one person who got a blood clot or their daughter or their, their spouse? It gets really, really personal. So the way the storytelling's gone around this, uh, this vaccine, it was about, we're putting it on pause. And that just sent everybody around the world into panic. Everyone's antenna are up. Everyone's like trying to get one of the other doses. The brand of Johnson & Johnson has been permanently scarred. And it didn't have to be that way. It could have been a different story. You know, it could have been something, I haven't thought this through, but it could have been something along the lines of, um, you know, we're, once the vaccine is developed, the work's not done. We're continuously studying how to make each of these concoctions, and we've got two or three different RN, uh, RN whatever they're called, RNA technologies that we're, we're mRNA technologies that we're working with, but we're trying to expand their efficacy. We're trying to figure out how long they will last, et cetera, et cetera. We just found out that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does something that we didn't expect. We always expect the unexpected, so here's what we're going to do. See how that story is less panicky? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that we have a responsibility as leaders to think of also a worst case scenario and have our crisis communication prepared or at least prepare ourselves in advance for, for, for what we're going to say and how we're going to say it when time comes. I'll tell you, um, my mother lives in Romania. She had the option to get the AstraZeneca vaccine and she turned it down. Um, and she's in the older age group, so she should have gotten it and she wouldn't take it because of the narrative in Europe where they stopped delivering the vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and then it's very hard to recover from that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't think anybody was prepared to tackle. They were just so focused on the science of it. They were not prepared to tackle the the narrative in case something bad happens. Yeah, the, the emotional side of it. And we do have that information. We do have professional storytellers in healthcare communication, but were they consulted? Probably not at the right time. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also highlights how no matter what industry, industry you're in, what we see with our clients and with the leaders that I work with is that they're just so focused on their science, on their technology, on what they need to produce, do, sell, that they forget that they actually have more stories to tell than that. Um, and that's what makes them thought leaders. But all of that knowledge, all of those stories, if they're not expressed through content online, through interviews, through webinars, through a TED Talk, all of that knowledge, if it's not expressed, it's not thought leadership. Yeah. You're not leading. You mm -hmm. have a story and you're holding it close. Um, you have to be brave and dare putting it out there. So, true. Um, so, so you can compel the world that there's more to you than, than just that gadget. And, you know, we could call that thought containership, you know. Hmm. I love it. <laughs> no, it's a terrible Yeah, thing. yeah. Thought so, yeah. prison versus thought leadership. <laughs> exactly. You know, I think that um, our, our, um, the institutions that we, this is going off on the tangent a little bit, but it'll come back in just a second. 
um, the institutions that we rely on so much have a worldview that's a little bit bigger than they are, but it's nowhere near the size of our entire planet with all the complex things going on at the same time. Climate and research, we have abundance of everything. We've never had less war, less poverty, less famine, less death. Even with COVID, we're in a very, very historically, in context, safe time. And we've never had better ed educated people. In the next couple of years, the entire planet will be covered with high bandwidth internet access. That is a world of abundance, but a lot of our institutions are still focused on world of scarcity. So it's the leader's job to work with other leaders and start to architect what that new us is going to be. So I'm a big fan of a hashtag, which I did not invent. I might be stealing it, but I, it's the hashtag is we, not me. And the idea behind we, not me is to think as a collective, think more than just about your company and your primary shareholders. Think about your employees, your partners, your customers, your community, the environment. Better leaders think about all of those things at the same time, and they focus on the one little decision that can help rise the tide in the bay so all the boats go up. And if you can get your storytelling to reflect that positive worldview about creating something that's new and better with people, like we talked about before with the immigrant story, um, that gets people to really lean in and listen because there's truth, there's evidence, and that picture of what the future is gonna be like becomes extremely real for them. And they start to choose that story over what they hear on some of the negative news channels. So that's a, yeah. it's a very important point for leaders to understand whether they're in startups or established large multinational firms that they really can turn control of the narrative into an asset that creates value for everyone. That's one of the things that makes me wake up every day and keep going at it. So let me see if I got this right. What you're saying is that the ability to, um, to tell those stories and to create those stories, to build those stories is a key component to leadership. That if they don't lead the way that way, us marketers don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it, has to, marketers, it, it has to become part of the fabric of an organization yeah. for marketers to be able to be successful at telling our stories in a, in a direct to consumer or, or in a B2B yeah. space. And we're back to the very first minute of our conversation. A story is not a tale. It's not something that marketing makes up. It's something that's real, that marketing amplifies. Because if mm -hmm. you're in business, you're in business to create value for your customers. Your brand is making the largest promise your company can to the betterment of another. And marketing is only steering, adjusting, amplifying, making sure that that happens. But if you don't keep your promises, you don't deserve to be in business. You, you should be in the mafia. That's what the mafia does. They make promises, they don't keep them. We will protect you. No, we're here to harm you and take your money. See what I mean? There's, there's a yeah. disconnect there. And I hope yeah. you don't have a big mafia following on this podcast because I might be in trouble. <laughs> no, but I have some followers who constantly criticize my looks. So, so I don't know where I would categorize those trolls. I have trolls. Um, <laughs> you know who does really well, not trolling, but thought leadership, um, Autodesk. And I think their publication, their digital publication is called Redshift. I'll have to check. Mm -hmm. But talking about taking a global perspective on things, their publication is all about future focused innovation mm -hmm. and not just in their core competency, which is architecture and, and, and that those areas, but also environment. Um, and it's a publication that I think anybody would want to read it's mm -hmm. it's just unbelievable that i i would want to go there just to read their articles and i'm not in that industry at all so it achieves this global this global perspective this inclusiveness that mm -hmm. you were talking about and that for so many it's really hard to accomplish that's awesome the fact that you feel that is a real compliment to the people that are putting that together that's a great vision, a great use of resource. And look, you're, you're the effect of that. What a, yeah. what a positive outcome. 
<laughs> I love it. Patagonia is another good one. But um, we all know about them, but uh, they even produce mini documentaries. They have this documentary that I love where they went to Turkey and you can't even tell that it's Patagonia, mm -hmm. um, except that once you find out, you see that all the backpacks and everything uh, is Patagonia, but they go to Turkey to investigate the origins of snowboarding and that in this village in the mountains of Turkey, they have been snowboarding a, a little bit of a different system than the snowboards we use here and that we know now, but apparently they're investigating if that was the origin of snowboarding. Wow. How and cool. at the end of the documentary, you realize it was produced by Patagonia. Mm -hmm. So another great example of storytelling that is global in its nature and that builds community and embraces diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a huge fan do? of theirs as well. What does a story like that do to the listener, the viewer, or the reader that's of even more value? What do you think? Well, it's a very strong um, um, story of mission and vision for them, serving the world, uh, what, what uh, respecting the, the world. What about for the viewer? Like, oh, what how do you it? feel different and better? Oh, I just know I felt all the warm and fuzzies and yeah, and you know, wanting to be associated with this brand that's forward thinking and inclusive and yeah. Well, it, it resonates with your values and. When we, yeah. um, when, we, when we look for entertainment, whether we're reading or going to a play or watching a movie or reading a book, I think a lot of us are really trying to figure out how to live. Because in our day to day, we don't get to have a lot of conversations about how are you living? How are you feeling? How are you moving along on your agenda? But when we find these, these mass media things or even little moments at a coffee shop that just give us a moment to pause, to reflect, we can kind of see ourselves in a new concept, in a new context, that's like mm -hmm. writing a new narrative. And then all of the things that we learn, they just go and they kind of line up differently. And we realize that we're a little different than we thought we were. We're a little closer over here or a little more connected over here. And that insight is like, it's like a rush. It gives you energy because yeah. you have some, back to the key word, you have clarity. Yes, yes. Um, I'll put a pin on that because something else that you said triggered a thought about social media is a space where people seek meaning. What we all do is try to find our place in the world. Our entire lives are the pursuit of seeking meaning of, of who we are and where we fit in the world. Yeah. And social media came in and started providing that opportunity for people in a very lazy way. I sit, I sit on my computer, I sit on social media, I interact with people, sometimes people that I couldn't meet or see any other way. And I feel like I'm part of a community and I'm building meaning with other people within that community. That's yeah. why it's so hard for people to step away from social media. It's like you're taking their family away. It's like you're taking their community away. Mm -hmm. Now, long term, that has proven to not be very beneficial to our mental health and so on. But the reason why social media is so compelling and brands started using it to, to sell their fares is because people are there to create, to to have a sense, to create a sense of meaning, to, to understand their place in the world. Mm -hmm. And very successful brands at marketing on social media do just that. They incorporate the needs and the wants of the people who are spending time online in creating communities that make them feel like they mean something. I'm, yeah. I'm appreciated, I belong somewhere. It's incredibly powerful. I think that falls into the category of beyond the product and beyond the service value for customers. Yeah. Because we think about yeah. value just being like, how much money do you pay me or how much do I put in my bank account? You know, how high does my stock go? But what you've just elicited are so many different kinds of value that people care about. They care about connectedness, they care about community, they care about emotional well being, mental well being so many other things and brands can offer that by just changing and connecting a few different elements that they don't even own. So it's so inexpensive to be a positive architect 
of positive change yeah. as you're selling your stuff. One of the things that I don't like about social media though, and I think this might be when you use the word lazy, is that I've witnessed, and I'm, I'm a little bit older, you know, so I've got a different view and I'm, I'm trying to stay current, but I have noticed a lot of people comparing themselves to others or judging others mm -hmm. as their outlet on social. And that's, in my opinion, a very lazy way to go about improving yourself or improving yeah. the world. Because all you're doing is just playing the positioning game. You know, it's the same thing as masters and the slaves um, with slavery in South America. The, the masters yeah. would always push the slaves down and, and give them doubt and not give them positive reinforcement. So yeah, yeah. It's, I, I'm, I'm disheartened when I see people use um, social media predominantly in a, you know, me versus you kind of way, because all they're trying to do is make themselves feel good, but it's just, it, it's ephemeral, it's not real. When you really wreak change on yourself and you learn new things and you connect with people differently, you build something the world can benefit from, you deserve to feel better about yourself and that automatically comes. So. I, I hope that we'll, we'll move things more in the direction of uh, it, it being a tool for good as opposed to a neutral tool that folks can do anything they want to on. Could use yeah. a little architecture. I don't yeah. know, what do you think? Yeah. Um, well, I, I actually do a talk on detox, on digital detox, on how mm -hmm. to take back control of technology. And there's... A couple of things that happen there. One of the culprits is the social networks algorithms, and the algorithms reward things that um, that get a lot of likes and shares and so on. But that content may not be realistic, or may may not be true science, or may, it's just more what's more sensational. Um, so the higher quality content can be hidden because of how these algorithms work. Um, and they work in their favor. They don't work. They're not algorithm, algorithms that work in the favor of the community. Mm -hmm. For example, Google's algorithm is trying to give the best answers to the questions you ask when you do a search. Um, email firewalls try to keep our inboxes clean and safe. So there are algorithms. There is technology out there that's trying to clean up the content so that you have a positive experience. That's not so much the case on social networks. So, mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the other thing is that um, we need to take back control of technology. We need to turn off notifications. We need to unfollow people that make us feel bad about ourselves. Um, we are not powerless. This is really important for people to remember. We are not powerless online. And Everybody would benefit even if, if brands embrace that in the ways they create communities. And here comes that whole inclusivity concept again. If, if how, how brands engage with people online is inclusive. If mm -hmm. people are a bit more, um, a, a bit more decisive and a bit more careful of who, who they allow in their space, I think we'd all be much better off and we'd all have a much better community experience online. Yeah. I support you on that. And I, I feel that's rather connected to the idea of clarity too, for brands, for platforms, and for individuals. Care to add to that? Yeah, I, I th one of the things I want leaders to know, it's really important to understand how the digital world works, both from a, a technological perspective as well as a human perspective. One of the things that we do, for example, is that we, we constantly have to educate executives and it doesn't have to be big concepts. We find, we found, we find people trying to uh, educate executives on technologies to use. What's the newest smart tech that we should implement? And that smart tech is gonna solve all of our problems. Instead of educating executives on what happens online and why people do the things they do. And thus mm -hmm. as marketers, why we should take a, this approach or that approach. But that clarity doesn't exist out there. We get so bogged down in just trying to, to evaluate the ROI of social media, for example, that we don't stop to think, how is what we're doing 
related to how people want to consume content, who they are, what's what's the mood, what's the trend out there that mm-hmm. can really impact our results. So it's a very practical example. To have clarity, you need to keep annotations of what happens. So if there is a mass shooting, you put an annotation in your Google Analytics to know that your numbers during that time, if they're impacted, they're probably impacted because of that. Because the mood changes online. People are going to consume content differently when something like that happens. It's kind of like a mood mirror. And we've never had a mood mirror before that we can see all at once what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not having these conversations with executives because it's the social media, the junior people who are dealing with that stuff. But at an executive level, it's important to understand how powerful those mood shifts are online and that we need to quickly adjust to them. We can have this perfect strategy and this plan that we've made for six months. It all goes out the window because all of a sudden COVID took over and we went into shutdown and people's people's behavior completely changed. Mm -hmm. I believe that I was sharing with you in one of our email exchanges that we obsess with the journey of the customer as if that's the story that needs to be told. But that journey is unpredictable and it's not linear. And we need to do better at listening instead of obsessing over technologies and all these catchphrases that executives hear at, you know, when they go to a webinar or a conference that's about MarTech. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to go back and talk about people. I think it's what you were saying earlier too. We need to go back to look at a, to have a more global perspective and be more sensitive to how people behave online, what they need, what they see, yeah. what the mood is. So Mana, if you were to put together a 20 minute part live, part recorded segment on a monthly basis for these executives, Okay, the ones that need to hear the more human and heart side of things. What might that look like? Just make it up. What do you think? 20 minutes. Oh, I think I think I, I would love to rip apart some myths. I would love to rip apart some some advice that I constantly see online that's just all just buzzwords. Yeah. One of the things that I've spoken a lot about is engagement. I would I've done a video about how we need to stop talking about engagement because we don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. So let's put some numbers around. What exactly does engagement mean? Is it that they click on a link? Is it that they comment? Is it that they send us an email? We need to be a little bit more specific there. So you Um, you bust some myths. You you break down some of the old adages that really aren't true and you offer some proof. All right, so you're two minutes in. What would you do with the other 18 minutes? Oh, that's it. That's all I need is two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's right. You're the two minutes. I, <laughs> I think I think for the other two minutes, I would invite some experts to have a conversation about that myth. I think I would I would want to bring in more people who who are mythbusters just like me mm-hmm. and who would love to tear apart some concepts and put them back together. So I think that putting things back together could be another couple of minutes in your 20 minute program. Um, maybe looking at the same problem and how it was approached differently and showing what the different results are. And then maybe digging into what the executives were thinking and how they made their decision. You know, what was it that let them kind of move a few degrees so that there was a change in the way things worked? That would be, that's so needed because I think people, a lot of leaders, and I know a bunch of them, they kind of fear what other people are going to think sometimes. They say that they're, they're adamant about their opinions and they're very sure. And sometimes they're really not, but they don't let you know that. So showing evidence of how other people change themselves could be really powerful. Because if we're trying to change customer behavior, we're trying to change people. And to do that, you have to create something that's better. You can't make people change. You can show them something that's new and better. You have to wreak it from nothing. You have to make it, fabricate it. And then when they see that, they'll choose to go over there. That, if you, I, I want you to do that. Please do that. I'll give it a shot. And I feel like this, this interview itself is, is part of that. If you had to do a 20 minute video and invite people to participate, 
who, what types of people would you want to interview and or what types of leaders would you want to have okay, so I would, as part I of the conversation? Up, I would probably pick up on the word inclusion from your comments earlier. And I would wanna show that a, a more human-centered approach to guiding organizations forward could work in lots of different ways. Because we're talking about a movement, not just a few reactions. Because the more people that believe the same truth, that we all have to take accountability for the way our world works, and we get to design the bed that we lie in, so to speak, that's an old phrase, the better. So I would want to look for some um, young female African entrepreneurs who are doing something cool in music and fashion together. I'd want to look at an old world manufacturing tycoon in Germany. I'd want to look at somebody doing something off the grid in Australia. I'd like to look at some mid-market business people and social entrepreneurs from the heartland of the United States. See what I'm getting at? To try to find how some of these common trends are good for everyone. Because when people learn that if they make a move and others make that same move, everyone's better off, I think it reduces resistance. But most people don't see those case studies. They're not, they're not open to hearing all those different points of view or they just don't have time. They've got uh, their day-to-day -day jobs that they feel like they need to do. So sharing how the way we lead successfully is more the same throughout the world than different. And the more we do things for people rather than to people, that that's better. That's generally where I'd steer my 20 minutes. I love it. Um, I like to do in when I do interviews like this, I like to do like a rapid fire round where okay. I'm not where, prepared, but let's go. You know, my <laughs> you know, my obsession with the two minutes. With the, with the two minute videos. So I'd love to ask you one question, like a rapid fire question. And if you have one for me, I'd be happy to answer it okay. as quickly as I can. Um, but if you were to talk to one of the leaders that you work with, and you have told me that you love working with female leaders in companies that are 500 employees and up, and there was one piece of advice that you feel like they absolutely need to hear, what would it be? On a personal level, it would probably be, be yourself. The most important thing a leader can do is understand who they are before they start pushing their ideas and opinions on others. The leaders who are more in touch, who are more humbled by an understanding of their place in the world, in my opinion, lead way better. They create much more value than those who are single-mindedly trying to sell 10 million copies of something that nobody needs. The second thing I would tell them is, and this is something I've said before, so I didn't have to think too hard. I'm not feeling the pressure. Um, it's no matter how hard you try or how much you spend, your brand can't be any better than what your customer experiences. So the notion behind that is back to, if you're making a promise with your brand, you have to keep it every single part of your business, your bots, your fax, your old fashioned fax machine, your in store, the people that work with your representatives and partners, they all have to be on brand, which means they have to share the same belief, see the same vision for the company, understand that their role as an, a player in that company actually amplifies the good that the company can do. So that's, that's what I, that's my two minutes. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing Thank that. You. Yeah. So here's my two minute, uh, my, my quick question for you. If you could go back and change one thing about the order that you learned your most important lessons. So think back to the most important lessons you've learned. Some you figured out, some are from your parents or from a great teacher or from the school of hard knocks. Which ones might you want to like adjust the order of? Great question. And I think I, I'm, I have clarity on this one. <laughs> okay. We are taught the school way, right? We, you have to take a class. Uh, you have to go to school, take a class, do an internship, then, then slowly dive into the work, have a mentor and so on. I would have a mentor earlier. I'd like to have a mentor earlier and the practice sooner rather than 
spend so much time. I mean, I went to grad school too, right? So I spent so much time just studying and I did some internships in journalism, but I never had a mentor mm -hmm. for the career to explore the careers that I want. And even later, I don't think I had a mentor until my thirties. So I'm a huge fan of having a guide, even, even if you are an executive, having a guy there, it's being a leader is very lonely. And being a student from a professional perspective is very lonely. You don't really have a guide. There's so many points in our lives where professionally we're very lonely. And that's the time to reach out and seek for help, whether it's mentorship, coaching, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. I love that. I love that. I want to share with you that when I was a kid, like um, I think I was in high school when I learned what a PhD was, because I said, well, why is Dr. Smith a doctor? He doesn't wear a white coat or go to a hospital type of thing. Oh, let me tell you. And I thought it would be so cool to learn the PhD stuff before all the technical stuff, because then you'd like learn how the world works. I always love that idea. And um, I there was one other thing I wanted to share with you. I know, just escaped me. So excellent answer for that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you saying PhD for me, grad school. My, my thesis was on rhetoric and discourse in the US coverage of the Kosovo War. So my fascination wow. with how we make meaning has been going on for a very long time. And I've mm. always thought that I was gonna go back and study now how we make meaning around war online. There's mm -hmm. plenty of material there. <laughs> so, you know, on social media, how we make meaning of war and what it means That's to us in our own countries and within our own cultural identities. I didn't do that until grad school. Yeah. But I feel like that was the one thing that carried me into what I do today. This, you know, this work with understanding what people want online and giving them what they want. Yeah. But it's, earlier uh, on, I had very little practice in that. Yeah. I love what you're saying there because um, so many businesses think their job is to make customers want what they sell. And the much better way to do things is to be what they want, you know, be best at what they want most. So I love that. I did yeah. remember that other thought and I wanted to share it with you. I was talking with some folks who are pretty deep into education around the world. Uh, this was about two months ago. And one of them brought the idea to me. They, they had these words. They said, you know, Mike, we're moving from a world where we did just in case learning. You know, you go get your PhD and then you go to work, but half of what you've learned is already out of date to just in time learning. And now most of the things that you need to know, you can find on YouTube, even if it's something sophisticated, like adjusting a, you know, a machine learning algorithm for language translation. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. we might want to do it, that one again with a dog barking, so. <laughs> well, what, what we just exchanged uh, in the last few minutes reminds me of two things. One, a friend who said, I don't know why I would go to college I can learn everything I need from YouTube. <laughs> and the other one related to give, give them what they need. The great Marshall Fields said, give the lady what she wants. Yeah. Um, so well, again, uh, it's the concept of us, not uh, we, not me, mm -hmm. us as a community and making it about them as, as the customers, as the target audience is not new. It goes back to Marshall Field times. Very cool. And probably yeah. before that, we've always had, we've probably always had those smart salespeople who thought that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about creating value for others. I just want to reflect a minute on, on the arc our conversations taken for the people who are listening this long. Um, what I think we've done is started from an assumption that we had some things in common and maybe a little bit of audience and professional interest in common. but because we've been listening actively, because we've been both very present in the conversation, we've actually created some new stuff. We've built some bridges, we've built a relationship, we've given some examples, we've taught other people, we've opened some minds, and all of that wouldn't have happened if we didn't ask and answer really good questions without expecting something ahead of time. Very open-minded, and I think that's a, another good leadership skill. Just wanted to point that out. So this is a great setup that you have here. 
Yeah, and it's very energizing. So to all the leaders out there, um, create opportunities like like we created for each other. We were two total strangers a week ago. Um, leaders should also create opportunities for dialogue like this within their teams, um, with them and their teams, and they can probably uncover so many more business and marketing ideas that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mike. What a pleasure. You've Thank given you. me so much to think about and a new book to read. So, <laughs> um, so, and I hope that we can have another one of these conversations and I hope everybody enjoyed this and send us your questions because we both like to answer questions and bring about clarity. So send us your questions and you can find me on social media at Manamika. Mike, where can people find you? You know, if you want to ask me a question, because we both have this really cool way of asking the public what they're interested in and responding personally, um, you can find me at storyminers.com, S-T-O-R-Y-M-I-N-E-R-S, slash, and then write these four letters down, Y for yellow, A for apple, M for Mike, A for apple. And that stands for You Ask, Mike Answers. So you leave your video question, and I'll leave you a video answer, no BS, straightforward, just for you within 48 hours. So I hope to see there you there. There you go. And we're going to put that on the screen as well. And hope to see you all back soon. Cool. Well, it was so much fun. Thank you. Love it was. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I truly feel energized by our conversation and um the intersection of some of the things that we both uncovered um the the concepts of inclusivity and so on um you know really was, a lot for me to think about i think there was a lot of co-creation going on you know we yeah. weren't just talking at each other we were building something together like building off of each other which was really fun and you know what i think you should share this little bit is the after part of the movie you know how the you always see one more scene after the credits. The takeouts, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You should do this as a takeout because yeah. I, I feel exactly the same way. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad you re you kept recording. Sometimes I like to record from the beginning even as we plan what we're going to say mm -hmm. because sometimes it's weird. Like sometimes the best nuggets come out out of that yeah. conversation <laughs> where we don't think we're recording but, but we are actually saying really interesting things. So yeah, that's so true. So true. Well, it was cool. so good to meet you. Same here. Thank um, you so please much. Please send Mike. me the recording and then we'll get editing and we'll share with the world. Wonderful. The, Wonderful. the search for clarity. <laughs> <laughs> and here's to a visit to New Zealand very soon or vice versa. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. From your, from your, what, what's the expression? From your mouth from to your... God's ears. How about that? There one? you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Mike. Right. Cheers.